project um, aerial vehicles and um, all the, the open source software involved there and in particular our main bit which is the L4 operating system microkernel. Um, I'm from an organization called Data61. Who has heard of Data61? Oh, more, more than I thought. <laughs> Do you know what it is? Um, <laughs> yeah, something like that. So, um, originally I was from NICTA. Who knows what NICTA is? Okay, a bit more. All right, so NICTA was the, the National Center of Excellence for ICT Research until some less enlightened prime minister cut our funding. This was incidentally just a few months after one of DARPA's program managers said, I can't believe why the Australian money, uh, government is not pouring money at you guys. <laughs> <laughs> Go figure. And then there's um, CSIRO, CSIRO, the um, federal government research organization that's been around for 80 years or something like that. And um, earlier, or last year, the, the digital productivity business group which is basically the ICT part of CSIRO merged with NICTA to become Data61. So that's what we are. Um, and this is all new and it's still in progress. The merger is happening and the organizational structure is getting worked out, etc. So a lot of stuff is temporary. So this is the background. Um, now to what I want to really talk about. Um, this is what happened in July last year. There is a helicopter flying in Mesa, Arizona, um, which is where Boeing builds their helicopters. And as you see, this helicopter flies autonomously. It does have a pilot in there. The pilot is not because they don't trust it, but because the FAA at the moment will not um, provide airworthiness certificates for something like, of that size that's totally autonomous. So they have to have a safety pilot on board. Um, and this flight is quite relevant to our talk because this is flying our software stack. So <clears throat> what's the context? The context of this is the DARPA HACKAMS program. DARPA, that's the funding agency of the US Department of Defense. Um, typically, everyone should know what DARPA is, right? They funded the internet 50 years ago. So they're a pretty well-known entity. They've um, funded a lot of very high impact work over the years. Some, they, they tend to flip in between modes of some very military oriented, very closed up, all secret stuff to being fairly open. And at the moment, they're in a very open phase. Um, so they had this call where they're actually funding um, us outside the US. Um, which in some parts in the history was pretty unthinkable. Uh, at the moment, they are actually encouraging more international applicants, so they're in a pretty open phase. And part of that is that pretty much everything we produce under this project is open source. Not the um, stuff that's like Boeing code, which is A, commercial in confidence, and B, actually export controlled, um, but everything that's not specific to um, one of these military vehicles is all open source. The aim of this DARPA Hackings Program, which stands for High Assurance Cyber Military Systems, is to raise the bar on high assurance system, on building systems, software systems that are significantly more resilient against cyber attacks than they were in the future. And it turns out that this is actually really, really, really necessary <laughs> because those systems are uh, scarily easy to hack. So in particular, we focus on functional correctness and on certain safety and security properties and uh, make, make sure that our code satisfies those. So f the specific aims of, this was a, a bidding process, right? They put out a call for proposals and then you put the bid together. And so the, the specific project aims is uh, related to our winning bid, which um, is to protect cy autonomous vehicles from cyber attacks um, and demonstrate in real world systems and open source everything. Okay, so there's um, actually three components, three teams in this um, DAPA project um, or program. One is the air team. Um, so this is where the Boeing helicopter comes in. 
And um, this is what I talk mostly about because we were part of this air team from the beginning of the project. And besides that, there is also a land team and the ultimate deployment there is on some autonomous army truck, US Army. And then there's a third, which is the, the red team. These are professional penetration testers and their whole job is to try to break in these systems. And initially they had no problem whatsoever. They had no problem to own that Boeing helicopter, for example. Um, now this is a company that does military stuff for a living, right? And um, the fact that this is so open and so easy to break is, is truly scary. The project is broken into three phases. It started in um, August 2012, so that's uh, three and a half years ago. And the first phase ran for 18 months. And it was basically, if you like, a warm-up exercise. We did a, a very simplified system and did a high assurance version of that. Second phase, which ran for the next 18 months, was to make it more complex, more reflective of the real world, and do a full system demonstration. Um, that was originally meant to be just on our research vehicle, a little quadcopter, but it turns out um, we were ready to actually fly on the, the full-scale um, commercial vehicle, the Boeing helicopter, uh, which was sort of interesting because DAPA, this is US government organization, you have contracts, right? They, they, it, there's actually deliverable associated with milestones, etc., and you have to deliver no matter what. And in the original project proposal, the flight demo of the Boeing helicopter was at the end of phase three. Now we were sort of ready at the end of phase two, but we couldn't call it a flight demo because that was in the third phase of the project. <laughs> so it was called a test flight. And um, then after that five, uh, phase three started, and this is the transition to the real world. As you've seen, a lot of that has already happened in second phase. Um, so basically, Hackham firing the uh, Boeing helicopter. Um, DARPA actually revamped the project a fair bit at the transition from phase two to phase three. Looks like they were not um, very happy with all the performers and they completely revamped the land team and threw out pretty much the operating system work that was going on there and moved us onto the land team as well. So we're now part of the land team and trying to find our way, et cetera, and um, architect that and uh, make sure that things work at the end. And then it turned out there's a possibility that our research vehicle, uh, this little drone, is actually going to be what they call a minimal viable product, something you can take off the shelf and actually put to real use. And the US Navy is interested in that. They, their interest is, for example, they have warships in the, um, uh, off, off the coast of Somalia trying to stop the piracy there, and sometimes they have to end a, a ship and um, they like to send a drone ahead to check it out so keep their soldiers out of harm's way. Uh, something like that might happen without just the research vehicle, which originally we only developed for having something to actually work on and uh, do demos, etc. So that's all cool. Um, <clears throat> so as I said, I'm going to talk mostly about the air team and we call ourselves SMACM, which stands for Secure Mathematically Assured Composition of Control Models, which is sort of a reverse engineered acronym because we like the term SMACM and it sort of <laughs> matches HACMs. So what we have in there is our little drone, as I said, the research vehicle. Uh, this is an off-the-shelf airframe. Um, it's actually, we replaced it by a later one. This is a, not the latest photo. And we basically, dump all the software that's on there, um, keep the microcontroller, add an additional processor, so we have two processors on the thing and I'll explain why, and this is where we develop um, everything and basically rebuild the whole software stack from scratch. And then there's the military or deployment vehicle, which is this um, Boeing unmanned little bird, which we've seen the, the video clip of it flying before. And our objectives are to provide real safety for the operation of the vehicle, which specifically means keep the red team out. It must not be able to divert the vehicle. And we are pretty serious about that, as I'll talk about in a moment. And all that, um, because we are hardcore systems people, and 
the back of my shirt says um, security is no excuse for poor performance and we're serious about that so our we, our maxim is we will never sacrifice performance just because we need security. We're convinced you can have both. Okay, so what's inside? I already mentioned there's two processor boards. So this is the architecture of the research vehicle, but it's actually very close to the architecture of the Boeing vehicle as well. And that's, of course, not an accident. We did that intentionally because we wanted our research vehicle to be as representative of the real thing as possible. <laughs> and in particular, it has these two computers. So the, the Boeing vehicle this is an old airframe that's been around for 30 or 40 years. So the electronics is relatively unsophisticated by modern standards. These days, a, a latest generation helicopter would probably have 100 processors or something. Um, this has two main processes and obviously there are sensors and GPS units and all that sort of stuff. So they all, obviously all have microcontrollers as well. So if, if you add that up, you get to higher numbers. But sort of as terms, in terms of what controlling what's going on in the system, they have basically the same architecture of a control processor, which is basically the cerebellum of the thing. It's low level flight control, the thing that keeps the thing stable in the air and flies to waypoints. And then there's the mission board. In the Boeing case, that's called the, the vehicle-specific module, or VSM, which does the interesting stuff. So this communicates with the ground station, for example. It sends telemetry data. And the communication with the ground station includes updating waypoints. So that's why it needs to communicate with the control board so that there's a bus connector. We choose bus because, uh, CAN, because it's um, uh, widely available. Uh, there's lots of embedded platforms that have um, CAN controllers. Obviously, the Boeing does not use CAN. They use something better. Uh, CAN is, in a way, sort of a, a worse case because it's completely in inherently insecure. If you can go on a CAN bus, then you can just, there's no protection against uh, spoofing messages, flooding it, what the, whatsoever. So, in that sense, it's, it's also a nice challenge from the safety point of view. Um, particular when in the third phase we're going to add a, on the research vehicle, a GPS module which we consider untrusted, so we assume someone can break in and use it to try and um, uh, spam the CAN bus, etc. And so we'll prevent that. So on the mission board, we have a lot of software and a lot of untrusted software. So there is um, image processing stuff which is complex. It runs on Linux. In the original Boeing system, everything ran on Linux. And um, we restrict the, the Linux, Linux for controlling stuff that we consider not mission critical. And all the real mission critical stuff runs native on our SEO4 microkernel. So that's the, the basic command and control software. And um, the part of the challenge is we, because we don't trust the red bits, which includes the Linux system, we assume it gets compromised. And we need to ensure that the system keeps operating safely, even if the Linux system is compromised. And the Boeing platform will actually have at least two different Linux VMs for, for different sensor and um, um, telemetry, etc., image processing, lots of stuff. We will end up with either two or three. Um, <clears throat> don't want to say anything else here. Oh yeah, the, one of the really cool things about this project, I've been an academic for a quarter century, and before that I was a PhD student for another five years or so, and during that time I was funded by industry projects. So it's basically 30 years of collaborative projects. I've never been in a collaborative project where there was so strong uh, real collaboration. It's, it's a dream, it's amazing, it's really cool. All the, all the partners are totally kick-ass, and um, Boeing, very committed, um, they actually say, well, they, they used to have a power PC board. We say, well, we would have to do a power PC port of the kernel. We can do that, but we probably won't use it for anything else. So we're not too excited about the idea. Can't you just um, change it for, uh, by, to, uh, change to an ARM or x86 platform? They said, okay. And so they removed the processor board, put in an i7 board. And um, now we've got something we are familiar with. Um, so, the real strong commitment. 
Okay, so what, what goes into the whole system? Um, so there's the architecture and the end phases where the vehicles, where the, all this stuff is running on. And what goes in there is first control code. And this is what our friends from Galois are contributing. If you don't, haven't heard of Galois, they are a essentially Haskell and formal methods outfit in, uh, in Portland, Oregon. Um, fair number of former UNSW students work there, it has to do with Haskell, I guess. And um, they are producing the actual control code. They have experience with this sort of stuff and build a system that is uh, designed to actually do this well. And then there's our friends from Rockwell Collins and one person or two at the University of Minnesota, which are specialists in um, architecture analysis, particular for safety and security cases. And then there's us who throw in the secure kernel. And then this all gets mangled up uh, with a lot of automation and uh, in the end put on the vehicles. So let's have a bit of a deeper look on what's in there. Um, fundamentally, a requirement for systems like that is strong isolation. Any well-designed, that means not any, but any well-designed security or safety critical system has at a very high level you this rough architecture. Some critical stuff and some less critical or in an extreme case untrusted stuff. Um, if it doesn't have this architecture, then it's probably broken. And if you, and if, if it's well defined, then the critical stuff is relatively small and um, hopefully really well engineered, etc. And you can see example of that everywhere. For example, a hard pacemaker. I, I tend to say I'm in my, I'm, I'm pushing 60, I'm pretty healthy, but I don't know, within 10 or 20 years, I may need a hard pacemaker. At the moment, I would be really worried because I know how easy it is to kill someone whose life depends on one of these and you won't leave a trace if you do it right. Uh, by the time I need one, I want to run it on SEL4. <laughs> but <laughs> if I ever need one. But what, what's in there? The fundamental life critical functionality of the heart pacemaker is something that reads inputs from a sensor and stimulate, uh, activates uh, an electrode that activates your heart, right? That's a very simple control loop. These th things are a bit more complicated because they basically try to involve um, knowledge about the state of your body, whether your heart rate is high or low, etc. But in, in essence, that's a very simple system. But then you need to be able to monitor the patient, you need to adjust the parameters, etc. And you don't want to open up the poor patient every time you do that. So they have wireless communication, typically Bluetooth or something. And of course, that means a big complicated stack, device drivers, network stacks, etc. Tens of thousands of lines of code written probably by electrical engineers and, um, <laughs> and, and not, nothing I would want to trust my life on, right? And that's why these things get hacked. And of course, if it's well defined, then this stuff that's sort of necessary for a reasonable operation of the device but not really life supporting and potentially compromisable should be strongly isolated from the really critical components. But of course the two need to communicate otherwise what's the point of having the two components on the system. And so this is what the operating system kernel's job is, is to provide the strong isolation and controlled communication where the communication should be subject to well-defined security or safety properties for the system. And this is what SEL4 is designed for. And in particular, who, who, know, who is familiar with SEL4? Ah, more people are familiar with Data61 than SEL4. That's a surprise. OK, so what is SEL4? It's exactly this. It's a high performance as well as high assurance microkernel whose job is to keep things safe. And I said we need isolation, and the really unique thing about SEL4 is it has provable isolation. And when I say proof, I really mean it in the sense of mathematical proofs as you learned them in high school, things that are rock solid. So how does that work? Well, like every real operating system, SEL4 is implemented in C. 
And obviously there is a little bit of a sampler in there, but we really went out of our way to minimize that. And um, Bernard, by the way, sitting here, my former student, he was the guy who um, basically rid us of the need to use a sampler for performance. He managed to get the C code to perform as well as any handwritten assembler code. And this is, was a real, a, a real major step for us because as long as we are in C, we can reason much better about the code than if it's a sampler. So we have the C implementation and my claim is this has provable isolation properties. What does that mean? Well, it means we have a formal model of the kernel. So that's basically a um, description, a specification of the kernel's API in a mathematical logic. And then in that mathematical logic, we do a formal proof which says that the C implementation is correct, is a correct implementation of the specification. The technical term is a refinement, which means that any behaviors that um, is possible for the C code under the semantics of C is allowed by the abstract model. So there's no, cannot be any undefined behavior. Does anyone um, spot where the challenge is or one of the challenges there? That's, a, that's the second thing, but that's not what I want was after in this particular step, Paul. Make sure it's bug free. Second? Make sure it's bug free. That's also something I'm coming to, but not what I wanted here. <laughs> all, all good points, of course. <laughs> yes, Neil's got it. So C not only has no uh, formal semantics, but it's actually also, its semantics is ambiguous. So if you want to do something where you can actually reason about this behavior, first thing you have to do is you restrict your language to a subset. The subset is, pretty, is about 98% of the language, but it's some, we have to impose restrictions of, uh, in order to actually have, be able to unambiguously define the semantics. And um, if we do that, then we can formalize the semantics, so we then have a formal, again in the same mathematical logic, description of what the semantics of C constructs are. And with that formal semantics, we can actually read the C code into the theorem prover and therefore have a formal version of the C code. And then we, can, then we have two formal models where we can show the equivalence by theorem proving. And um, this is all very manual work. This, the C implementation is about 9,000 lines of code. Guess how much, how big the proof is? Uh, you know it. <laughs> 200 K lines of handwritten, except for about 20 K that's uh, generated, but 200 K lines of mostly handwritten proof script to prove the correctness of 9,000 lines of C. If you think of doing that with pen and paper, it would be utterly worthless because your pen and paper proof would have way more bugs than your kernel you start with, right? So this only makes sense in a mathematical proof assistant which basically checks every proof. It will not accept something as a proof until, unless it can actually reduce it to the, um, in, in the end to the axioms of the system. So this is how this functional correctness works. Um, we finished that about six and a half years ago. Uh, the paper we published about that just got over a thousand sites. So it's uh, reasonably well read. Okay, but that leaves exactly the issues um, had, that you two have identified, namely, is the abstract model any good? And how about the compiler? Do we really want to trust the C compiler? Um, turns out there seems to be an easy way out because there's a um, verified C compiler done at Inria in France, which correct proofs, which produces provably correct code. To, and we can compile the kernel with that compiler. It runs about a factor of 10 slower. Um, which is not really what we want, but in the end it doesn't actually help us because that one has a semantic that's formalized in a different mathematical logic. And unbelievably to me, um, these live in two different mathematical universes and you can't show that they're equivalent. Bizarre, but that's the reality. So what we did instead is did a tool that uses a formalization of the ARM architecture which was done at Cambridge University to read in the binary code and then prove it equivalent. 
basically we prove that the um, binary is a correct translation of the C using the semantics of C and the formalization of the hardware. And the nice thing is this takes any assumptions we made about the C semantics out of the proof chain because we use the same semantics in both steps of the proof. So there's no more, even if we had a different assumption on the semantics as the compiler did, it wouldn't matter because we show that the result is correct anyway. So that takes care of the compiler. And then why, how do we know the abstract model is any good? Well, you need to prove that it has the properties you want. And these are essentially isolation properties. So we prove the classical CIA properties Basically that the kernel, if you configure your system correctly, that's always an assumption you have to make. If you configure your system correctly, it will um, maintain isolation. Basically it means if you set up a system that is partitioned initially and you do it the right way, the system will keep it partitioned for its lifetime. And, and that is even the case in the presence of uh, specific communication channels. It means the proof shows that communication data flow will only happen through these explicit communication channels. So this is um, what I mean with provable isolation in SEO4. It's as rock solid as you can get with software, basically. And um, there's a few exclusions. We haven't verified the boot code, not because um, we don't know how to do it. We've actually done it on an earlier version on a more high level lot model so we know exactly how to do it. It's just boring as batshit and therefore um, we're waiting for someone who really wants it and gives us um, half a million bucks and then we'll do it. Um, <clears throat> and there is some st stuff, basically MMU operations which are not modeled at the moment at the ISA level but slightly higher level and um, would like to pull that down to the same uh, degree of um, assurance as everything else. Multicore is in progress, we have funding for that, um, but the funding at the moment is a trigger, so it will take a long time. And covert timing channels, our logic only doesn't have a notion of time, so we can't reason about timing channels, but we have other work that um, is, aims at eliminating timing channels, and that's going to come to fruition fairly soon. Uh, MPC, on top of all of that, it's the fastest microkernel around in terms of the typical microkernel metric of message passing performance. It delivers a message across address space in 300 cycles on ARM and x86, and there's no other kernel that is faster. Um, and with relevant for safety, we also have a sound worst case execution time analysis of kernel. Um, that's also done by Bernard when he was a student. And to my surprise, there's no other system out there at least published that has this, which seems bizarre. So people do cri live critical real time code on systems where they don't have a real sound analysis of worst case timing. Very scary. Just think of all these nuclear power plants out there. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> so, this is the kernel. How do we then make the whole system trustworthy? Um, how much time have I got? 10 minutes. Hmm? 10 minutes. 10 minutes. Okay, cool. Um, so, basically, how do we get assurance into our user level code? And this is where our project partners come in. So Galois has this system called Ivory Tower. And this is a domain-specific language which is designed to um, implement control code. So exactly what you need on the vehicle. So all the control code is implemented in Ivory Tower. Um, the Ivory is the actual control code language. Tower is the thing worth where you define the frameworks around it, the architecture, et cetera, but it's sort of one integrated system. And from that, they generate C code. Now that generation is not provably correct, but it's still a reasonably good assurance because it's generated rather than handwritten, and there is a lot of formal methods work that's actually gone into Ivory and Tower, so it's reasonably trustworthy, but it's not the same degree of assurance as we have for the kernel, so that's important to know. Um, what they also do, is generate a architecture description in a language called AADL, something architecture description language. And from there, we generate a um, code for Chemcus, which is a component framework for our SEL4 kernel, which contains a more low level component description. So it both represent si similar things. Um, AADL focus on the high level architecture and CAMCAS is actually the, the individual components that end up as being address spaces on the kernel. And from that, 
we generate glue code, which is basically the stuff that invokes kernel operations. Why do, and from those two source code sets, we compile the binary. Why this complicated um, roundabout way of getting to glue code? Well, basically, this is, way, uh, is a way to increase the assurance of the thing. So what um, Rockwell Collins do, they have a, long, a lot of experience of using formal methods, model checking on these architecture descriptions. And they routinely use this for safety and security cases for critical software. So they do things like verify that the system has the right isolation properties at the architecture level. So data flow is only allowed where it's supposed to happen, et cetera, and um, certain other safety properties. And the other interesting thing is for our chemical system, this is not yet production ready, um, but for generating the glue code so that the thing that contains the actual system calls that invoke the OS, um, we uh, have a, we're working on a verified generation process. So that works already for some examples. The student is just presently writing up its thesis and that should make it into the system sometime this year. At the moment, this is work in progress. So basically, we do this um, detour or bifurcation via this uh, architecture and component description in order to increase the assurance and be able to let more formal methods loose on the system. The, the assumption at the moment is the system, the critical code is too big to do the same hand verification job as we've done in SEL4. Okay, so what's the outcome? This is where the red team comes in, as I said, professional penetration tech uh, testers. Their job is to attack the system and try to control it. And to make life easier a bit, we actually give them a root shell on our Linux VM. <laughs> We assume they will compromise it anyway, so we might as well uh, short circuit this. And then the, our safety claim is they control the Linux system, they can't do anything to the rest of the system. In particular, they cannot divert it, they cannot mess with the control system. And they found they can't. So we're good. Uh, and this was a total white box attack. They have everything, they have the source code, um, they have all the um, architecture level descriptions, everything, and they couldn't hack in. At the moment, there's certain things still quarantined. We have red and blue boxes on our system. The red ones are, we haven't done that yet, stay off there. Any compromises through that, this stuff don't count. Uh, by the end of the project, there will be no more red boxes except the stuff we consider explicitly untrustworthy. Um, so they can do what they want. At the moment, for what we think we have secured, they didn't manage to break it. And um, well, DARPA's in-house hacking expert actually said, this is the world's most highly assured drone, which is nice, given that they fly these military things everywhere. Um. <laughs> okay, so this is what pretty much the present state. Um, we're working on more cool stuff. In particular, we want to be able to actually formally verify the, the user level code as well. And the big step towards is this, what we call the code improved code generation project. So the idea is you want to have verified C code in the end. And um, from, we start with some abstract data types. So basically general libraries of functionality. And um, the idea is we, very, we implement and verify those by hand. But then system-specific code gets written in a domain-specific language, and that gets compiled both into C, a module description, and a formal proof that the C is, um, satisfies the, the module spec. And then there is some more handwork of proving that this all works into an overall system, um, th that the overall system uh, satisfies its spec. At the moment, we're trialing this in file systems. We already have two file systems where this automated stuff works, and we have the automated proof of the module implementation. Uh, one is a st standard X2 file system. It's feature complete with respect to the old original X2 ver um, specific oh, version, so not quite up to date with the latest one, but it's a complete file system minus symbolic links. And then BuildBFS, which is our own homegrown one, um, 
which is basically, we did that from scratch because we wanted more modularity and see what we can do with that. Um, there's a paper in, in ASPLOS in April which describes all that if you're interested. Okay, so just a quick status. Where are we? This is what in SEL4, what's presently out there. So there is an, a verified version for ARMv6 with all these properties I talked about. Um, there is unverified extra stuff, um, which is a lot of it is in branches, so people can actually play with it, particularly our project partners. And the, we're working on merging that into mainline. So this is um, ARMv8, including all the virtualization support. Uh, mixed criticality, real-time support, this is really cool stuff that allows us to do other things no one, functionally no other system can do at the moment. Um, virtualization support for x86. There's a roadmap which, will, which says when all this will pop up in mainline, um, <clears throat> including 64-bit ARM, etc. Multicore, um, we got a pretty good version running and this should be released uh, second sem semester, uh, second quarter this year. And um, then there's a verification roadmap which says when these things will be verified. Verification always lags behind implementation for obvious reasons. Um, but this is all what we've committed for and what we have funding for, which is the important thing. And um, the whole th stuff, everything that goes into SMACM, minus the um, vehicle, the commercial vehicle specific code is all open source in various repositories and you can have a look and play with it and become part of the community. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, so have your questions, just take the mic. So um, you mentioned that you done this 200k line proof several years ago and I assume since then SEL4 has changed somehow, fixing yep. bugs or improvements or whatever. Yep. So how, how much proof work has to be done every time you make a change to SEL4? How stable is it? Well, the, it's a research vehicle, right? And we keep developing it. I was just talking about um, this uh, real-time support that goes in, um, the timing channel defenses, etc. So the kernel is involving and we're adding stuff. And the obligation the, the, the internal deal we have, if we push something into mainline, there's a commitment to verify it. So the, the verification is, as I said, lagging behind the implementation, but it's being kept updated. So this is actually one of the interesting aspects of this project. We, we figure at the time we've done the verification, it was the second biggest proof ever. By now, six and a half years later, it's by far the biggest maintained proof through five, six, seven years evolution of the system, we kept maintaining the proofs. And we actually learn a lot about what we call proof engineering, just building proofs so they are maintainable and um, building on existing proofs and evolving them and all that stuff. And one of the interesting outcomes is, okay, what if you change the line? Does that throw everything in a heap? And one of the really interesting learnings from the project was the uh, effort to fix up the proofs is essentially proportional to the effort of actually doing the change. So something that's a trivial change in the implementation, say some slight optimization, tends to be trivial, reasonably trivial to prove. Something that's really deep tends to be a lot of work to reproof. And it's similar to the effort you have to go through to validate it with traditional methods, right? Do code inspections, do test suites, and all that sort of stuff. So that, that's a really good thing. The scalability of the proof engineering is better, much better than we feared it would be. Um, I noticed up there that you had the, um, the Linux kernel and the image processing stack were considered un, like, untrusted at this point in time, but you are talking about autonomous vehicle systems, so something like image processing is actually kind of important if you're considering, say, a military drone choosing what it's going to fire a missile at. Um, yeah. What, what, what's the sort of scope, because uh, I know you mentioned that you were working on proving the user land components that you could actually take, say, an image processing engine and prove that so, can't be compromised. Yeah, good question. Um, obviously, it's important, otherwise it wouldn't be on the system, right? And, um, but it's not mission critical in the sense that the vehicle can still fly home if it's broken. And one typical thing you do as a defense there is sensor fusion. You have different 
you, video is used among others for positioning, etc. You have also GPS, you have inertial sensors, etc. And all these feed into, into a position model. And if one of them diverts because it gets hacked, as happened with this US military drone in Iraq where they spoofed GPS, then the system is supposed to notice that and ignore that sensor. So that's the basic attack, um, which obviously this is not our kettle of fish, there's other people to worry about. And there's actually, in the, in the land team specifically, there's people working on, on these kind of things. Um, but in the end, you cannot ever completely trust a Linux system of 10 million lines of code, not for my professional lifetime. It's just beyond reach of making it completely trustworthy, whether you like it or not. So the best thing is defend against possible attacks there. Peter? Are you able to talk at all at the moment about the CAN bus and how you plan to deal with you know, an untrusted unit on it spoofing messages and flooding it? Yep. So the, the way we do deal with the CAN bus, um, and this is actually a package of work in the whole project, is we have two CAN buses. We have the trusted CAN bus, and we have one where, which connects untrusted devices, and there's a gateway which is going to be verified and which makes sure that only messages that make sense come through. And in particular, you stop babbling idiots and stuff like that. And it would be good if the automotive industry used the same. <laughs> so you said you use the uh, Cambridge version of ARMS uh, for verification. Can you guarantee that the hardware it's actually running on conforms to that? You can't guarantee that unless you have access to the hardware designs. When the Cambridge people started, they actually had access to hardware descriptions of a really old version of the processor. ARM gave it to them. So this is how the, the whole project started. So at that time, they had an ISA formalization that was provably correct against the spec or the, the HDL or whatever it was. Um, but that was for a very old process. So si since then, they're working closely with ARM um, on using traditional validation methods to, to show that the model has the same behavior. It's, it's obviously a problem, right? This is, hardware's the weakest link in my eyes. Um, we all know that um, hardware you can buy off the shelf has backdoors from either the NSA or the Chinese or the Russians in there. Um, what do you do there? Unless you're in control of that back door, then um, you can't completely trust the hardware. This is a very, very serious problem. It's out of our range for solving. Um, and in the end, the only way to solve that is by having a controlled um, design and production process and build in things which um, are sensitive to any manipulations. And there's work going on in that space, but that's not our domain. Anyone else? Awesome. That's what we've been around the Thank you. <laughs> and after that's good. So, Thank you very much. Um, it's about 10 minutes till I'm